Sara, I, I think uh, Indian chess, if we talk about a superstar, then the first name that comes to mind is Vishy Anand. But would you say that there was someone like a superstar before him in Indian chess? And if there were, there were, were there many, or who would you say are the most popular people? Manuel Aaron, without any doubt, the grand old man of uh, Indian chess. <laughs> he is around 86 years mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. I think somewhere around 86 and still going steady, still training youngsters, young boys, teaching chess. You know, to give a perspective of what kind of times Manuel Aaron came up through chess, he became an international master in 1961. Imagine, I mean, when even air travel was considered as a luxury, probably, or difficult, or even impossible. And how many tournaments in an year that everyone would play, it's it's mind-boggling, you know, to think of those times. Right. So, Manuel Aaron, who became an international master of, first international master of India from 1961, who also took up roles as an administrator mm. for the game of chess in India, is a definitely, a, you know, a colossus of a personality. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, being his colleague in Indian Bank for about uh, two and a half years, from 1990 to 1993. Oh. Uh, a very remarkable personality. He's won nine national titles, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then he was an administrator, like I think he was the um, secretary of Tamil Nadu State Chess Association. He has he, been the secretary of All India Chess Association. He has been the secretary of AICF. And yes. also he has um, been a journalist. He has been an author. So he's just explored everything in and around chess and uh, done it at a very deep level. Yes. And also, you know, uh, played for three Olympiads in India in the 60s, uh, late 60s. Even till 1980s, he used to play the Commonwealth Championship in London. So as a chess player also, I I played only one game with him. In uh, 1994, I remember very well. I played e4, he played d5. I went wrong in the opening and I lost a pawn in the opening. Then I built up an attack on his king side and I had a pseudo queen sacrifice. I just take queen a7. If you take king a7, I play bishop c7, it's checkmate. I still remember when I played queen a7, his face on the chessboard. Afterwards, he said, queen a7 is simple but at the same time beautiful. You know, he did say that I missed a win here. I was a pawn up and those kind of things. One, This was remarkable. At that time, it stayed in my memory for a long time. Manuel Aaron is also one of the coolest chess players I have seen on the chess board. Time pressure, the flag would be hanging in mechanical clock. Manuel Aaron's face will not show any emotion. The ability to stay calm on the board, he was my inspiration. The generation of players at that time in Tamil Nadu, Raja Ravi Shekhar, TN Parameshwaran, K. Murugan, and of course in All India level it was uh, Varagi Skoshi, Ravind Tipse, Dibandu Barua. But there were some things about Manuel Aaron which I observed, learned, and respected him for it. It will stay with me forever. That Especially that ice cold nerves on the chessboard even under time pressure. Yeah. And I think this uh, thing which you mentioned about him saying that, you know, this was a good game played by you. Uh, it also shows his objectivity. Uh, and when I met him recently, I could sense that, you know, when I sometimes meet people who are, who have played chess in the past era, they have sometimes mi- lost their sense of objectivity. You know, they're talking yes. about some uh, old games, they're talking about stuff. But here he is, you know, you ask him about his achievements. And he always qualifies it with something like, you know, I, I spoke about his Olympiads that, that he played. And he's yeah. like, yeah, but at that point, this player was old. So, you know, I could win it at that point. Stuff like that. And I was like, he could have said that, you know, I beat two world champions, uh, ex-world champions at that point and so on. So, that was, uh, as you said, very special for me as well. Yeah. Uh, by the way, he was an orbiter also. Ah. He was an international orbiter who has... Uh... Uh, in one of the nationals which I played in Calicut in uh, 1990, he was a chief orbiter of the tournament. Also. Wow. So, a man of many hats without any doubt. So, the first Olympiad that he played was, I think, in 1960. Uh, and that was Leipzig Olympiad. And uh, at that point, what I read recently in one article was 
that India would not send its team like there was no funds. So the players had to put in their own fund. And I mean, to to go to an Olympia itself was a big, big challenge. Definitely. I mean, it was a completely different era. But still, you know, one memory of me was looking at Aaron's photograph at that time in one of the Olympias. You know, he was completely suited with tie and all that. After I joined the Indian band, you know, he was one of the best dressed people in the it, building. Would, would you say this this one? Yes, absolutely. I mean, today's tournament halls, you go, especially in India, you see t-shirts and jeans everywhere. You almost yearn for this time in <laughs> chess history, you know, when people took the business of playing chess very seriously and dressing up very seriously, you know. Even when I joined Indian Bank, I was colleague, I always used to see him. He was always well-dressed, always a full-handed shirt, you know, always in proper G, proper uh, trousers and uh, black, black shoes. He belonged to an era where, you know, a kind of a decorum you brought mm. to whichever position you were in, whichever role you play, play your orbiter, organizer, everything. You brought a kind of decorum. And of course, he founded uh, India's first chess magazine, Chess Mate. And yeah. uh, he was its editor. And uh, in my opinion, a very, very well-run magazine. For, yeah. Now it's close to four decades now, more than four decades. I still remember in 1984, the first issue of Chess Mate was distributed free. So my brother took a postcard, wrote our address, our house address, and sent it to Chess Mate. And it was delivered by post, you know. I still remember I have Chessmate, Chessmate issues from the very first issue. For about 10 years, I have all the issues of Chessmate. Actually, there is another gold mine there from which you can scourge more stories probably at a, at a later point. This chess magazine, I very well remember. Many, many small details were very, very re well researched by Aaron before he would publish it. Right. He, he would not write things on here, say many things. He had a sense of humor, which was a little offbeat. We couldn't understand much of many things, what he wrote. But he did have a sense of humor, you know. Many things about him stay very fresh in my memory. I think uh, when players would be featured in Chessmate, it would give them such a nice boost. And that uh, propels the chess culture of an entire nation. Because when you know that your picture is coming on the cover or your game is going to be published, you feel like next tournament I should do even better. And somehow it leads to the growth of, uh, of an entire country's level of chess. Exactly. Uh, what you are doing today in Chess Base India, I would say Chessmate did it at that time. For those times, the maximum they could. You understand what I mean? See, those days, if you are starting a chess magazine, and if you have to get even a small thing, for example, sending a magazine by post uh, without, you know, covering it and uh, without, I mean, pasting it, leaving it open. And uh, there used to be a, a facility called book post. You send a magazine or any publication, which is not personal in nature, then the postage is very low. At the time, Manuel Aaron said, to get book post facility approved for his magazine took him 35 days. And he visited an office close to 20 times just to get the postage approved. Today's kids cannot even understand this, obviously. You communicate with another by WhatsApp in 10 seconds, at the maximum two minutes by an email. You understand? So they were completely different times. And this was a very, very hardworking man mm. who had to probably for whatever roles he played in the chess field in India, he really worked hard for all of them. Right, right. And he managed to play against some of the best players in the world. So I think he was the first person uh, uh, with whom we could say like, okay, uh, how does an Indian compare to the absolute best players in the world of chess, right? I th uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, he's played against Botwinik, he's played against Fisher, he's played against you, he's played against Portish. I mean, the there's a list, big list. And most of them happened at the Olympiads. Yes. And mind you, those days in the Olympiad used to be a, uh, a two-story tournament. First, you have a preliminary group and then the finals. Yeah. Right. So, and final A, final B. So, in the preliminaries, he met U Uwe, uh, Botvinnik. Yeah. Uh, there is even a game against Florencio Campopanas, who later on became the mm. president of uh, uh, the FIDE. 
So they also had a personal friendship because of that. They knew each other and he had a personal friendship because of that also. Right, right. Yeah, I think uh, we can look at his game against Max Ewer, uh, which he won. Right. So this is uh, Manuel Aaron versus Max Ewer. And this was played in 1960 at the Leipzig uh, Olympiad. And, you know, the thing about this is, uh, sir, I spoke with him about it and I said, you beat... Uh, Max Ewer, that's already a great achievement, you know, he was a former world champion. And he said, uh, imagine that a young kid today uh, plays against me in Indian chess, isn't he going to beat me? So, you know, at that point, uh, he was on his way out, you know, Max Ewer was uh, not as strong as he was when he was as a world champion. But that See, was his objectivity. Possible, but still they were the, they were the greats of world chess. At that time, to play them and beat them, look at Aaron's willpower and self-belief. Amazing, simply. So he's right? He, yeah, this game. You know, later on, uh, I had the pleasure of talking to a couple of his competitors of those era, Rafiq Khan and Mohamed Azan, Nazaruddin Ghalib, who was also later on uh, became an Al-India Suspiration Secretary, who was also Aaron's rivals in the 60s and all that. Nazaruddin Ghalib told me that in 16s and 70s, Mano Leran was the only person who knew the principles of many games, basically. In all that generation, everyone played original chess because many of them learned chess by playing Indian chess with different rules. Right. So Mano Leran was the only person who studied books, who had access to literature. So he played according to many game principles. Even in this game, if you look at it, Aaron, most of the time, puts his pieces in the right squares. Mm. He gives up this pawn for uh, compensation. E4, D5. Well, we shouldn't be too harsh in this game. After all, you know, this was his baby steps. But okay, he always had an advantage. Some other thing here. And I think this entire plan yeah. with uh, Longcastle and breaking with C5 was very cool. Uh, yeah, see, somewhere around here, uh, yeah, just before knight f1, I would say, uh, we should focus on after triple o, bishop c8, 18 more bishop c8. See, this is basically where a person who knew his chess at that time, knight f1, knight e3, knight f5, mm. which we would, today we'll take it as a given. Any kid of 1500 is going to find it in 10 seconds, even in blitz. But at those times from India to, to find manuals like this, this is essentially the strength of Aaron at those times. Bishop e1, knight came in, queen c2, bishop h3 and the knight goes to yeah, e3. Finally the knight e3 comes here. <coughs> yeah. Bishop f2, long castle. This was basically the moment I think UA was pushed into complacency. Hmm. Bishop f2 gets ready for triple o. So he could have probably delayed triple over a little at least by playing knight at seven and so on. And so from here on, it is really, really good play by white. Yeah. A4, trying to soften up the king, king b7, b4. Yes. And also this requires some understanding, which is like, you know, you can move the pawns in front of your king uh, because you have space advantage. His attack is not going to come through. He has no pieces. There is a story about this. You know, uh, I came to Chennai in the late 80s. So 80s and 90s, Manuel Aaron was a very, very uh, center stage of organization in Chennai. So I used to meet him literally every day. Uh, every tournament, he would be the present player or better. So in one of the final day functions, uh, you know, Aaron was someone who always shared his knowledge, shared what he knew and all that. So... He was telling an instance when he, when he was talking about learning in chess, he told this instance. You know, those days, the Soviet-Indian cooperation, so they would be sending a grandmaster every year who would come and uh, do coaching camps and uh, all, all those things. So they sent this grandmaster, M. Sutin. So Sutin identified Aaron as one of the weaknesses. After you play double O, most of the time, many times you are tempted and you play G4 and start attacking the opponent on the king side. And most of the time, the attack succeeds not because of your schemes, but because the opponent errs. Most of the time, those moves G4 is not correct at all. 
the concept is not justified at all. Watch it in future. Karen said afterwards, after a couple of months, I'm playing in this. And, and the most natural move which comes to be G4 in my hand. Then I think about Sutin's words. Yeah. Then I see that, yeah, he told G4 is one of my weaknesses. But in this position, it looks perfectly correct to play G4. He plays G4. And after a few moves, I realized that Sutin was right. I, we can make inside again. This move, incidentally, this game also see what Aaron B4. does. Plays B4. So you see, if you can equate the moves on the board with his personality, this was typically Aaron. Hmm. You know, do what you do as, believe that it is correct. Do what you do. And of course, always looking towards a, 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 a positive outcome play for a win even against the greater players amazing b4 uh, and you were played c5 here yeah this was the decisive mistake i believe yeah maybe it was you could not have defended needed. with probably petrosian is a6 or rook b8 and king c8 but definitely not c5 it is just a mistake hmm. c5 takes takes and now the knights get this beautiful square on d5 yeah take Knight takes, knight takes, and e takes. And this is exactly what he wanted now with c5 coming up and he pushed it. Yeah. This was actually a nice move, c5. In fact, in this position, if white doesn't play c5, hmm. then Sutin's word may come through. White's king also may become weak if he just manoeuvres here. So c5 was well timed, bold, and kind of, you know, one of those let's get it let's let's go get them kind of okay. correct rook g8 c6 king c7 a5 and after takes queen a4 so very uh nice way to attack here he won the crucial pawn and with these two passers it is i think at some point you could have resigned he was yeah. a rook down but he tried to some keep playing on yeah, here he's rooked down now. And yeah, here he resigned. So. Much later, when uh, we were talking to uh, Galib and also I am Raja Ravishekar, they used to tell uh, some of this victories by Aaron, you know, Max Hugo and all that. One of the main reasons why and how Aaron could achieve his victory was he was one of those players in India who always believed that he could beat them. Even if you play the absolute genius, absolute greats of chess history, like, I mean, Max Uwe, Fortish, where do they belong to in the history of chess? Correct, yeah. correct. No book can be written leaving these two names in those periods. But the self-belief that you can beat them, that was a quality that Aaron had. Right. And I think it's, uh, it, it's like on his shoulders, the next crop grows. So like when he beat these players, it opened up kind of one door. Uh, also, is it true that uh, the Tal Chess Academy, which was Tal Chess Club, which was created, was because of his efforts? Yes, very much. Basically, uh, you know, not only Tal Chess Club, even the Tamil Nadu Chess Association, in mm. my opinion, it is the most vibrant association among all chess state associations in, Jai, in India. You know, Mano Leran, right through 80s, 90s and all that, you know, he was the winner of the Arjuna Award, mm. for which he was given this train pass by the government. He would use the train pass every weekend. He would travel to a faraway district. Uh, I believe he was originally from Tutukurin. So he sold district, Tutukurin, Kanyakumari. He would go to anywhere the overnight train would take him in Tamil Nadu and do something on a Saturday Sunday chief guest for a function, give a lecture for free. Mind you, he did not do it for any monetary purposes in those days, giving these lectures and all. They were all given free. I have sat in a Tamil Nadu state team chess championship in 1986. The final day function was held in a place called Dharmapuri. It's a very small hamlet kind of thing those days, you know. Now it's a town. Aaron, understanding that nobody would understand him if he speaks in English. He gave a long speech in Tamil. It was one of the most positive speeches I've ever heard. It, is, it was all about how to popularize the game in a, in a hamlet like Tamil Nadu in 1980s. Mm -hmm. This is what you should do. 
try to get chess pieces and chess sets. This is where it is available. Open a place. Just encourage youngsters to come and play. Conduct tournaments whenever you can. can. You need not give great prizes, but give some prizes so that children would love to come back and play again and again. A very, very simple speech for very, very simple folk in a small town, encouraging them how to play chess. So, Amazing, no? Like today... Uh, in my like... opinion, Tal Club is not his achievement. His achievement was, first of all, founding these district associations of Tamil Nadu. Mm. You see the grandmasters in Tamil Nadu. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. It has like 27 GMs now in the state. And, and that that is because of uh, this and all the time new talents keep on coming up and everyone is uh, asking like what is it special that Tamil Nadu does that it has so many GMs maybe the the foundation was created at this point right by Aaron yeah he had a special relationship with uh, Dr. N. Mahalingam one of the greatest men whom I ever, I ever, ever had the pleasure of meeting and shaking hands with they had a special relationship. So, Dr. Mahalingam headed the All India Chess as the president and Aaron was the secretary. Many, many positive things. Starting with creating Grandmaster Tournaments where Vishy Anand achieved a Grandmaster mm -hmm. title. Manuel Aaron was the secretary of the All India Chess Federation when Anand achieved the title in 1987. You know, So, many things which have resulted in today's scenario where India is now a global superpower in chess. Started those days by people like Aaron. I would say Aaron was in the forefront of that movement which has taken chess somewhere where it is today. Phenomenal. Yeah, it's so inspiring. And I think we should remember these, these greats, you know, like today we are talking about Indian chess going places. Everyone's speaking about how, uh, you know, we'll be a superpower in a few years. Uh, and we go back into 1960s and so on. And Indian chess was almost nowhere. So the way it has been built up uh, brick by brick is amazing. It's a nice story. 1989, Indian bank where Mano Liran um, was working as a chess player and where uh, D.V. Sundar came from, who established a strong base for chess players in Indian bank by recruiting so many players of those times. So... Aaron and Sundar, they, they used to conduct every year an open tournament for uh, by Indian Bank. Indian Bank Open, it used to happen in Chennai. A very good tournament those days, by those standards. First thing is, they would give a very good tournament hall for those days. It was unheard of. They used to play in shabby tournament halls, even national A's and national B's. So, one year, they suddenly made the Indian Bank Open a knockout tournament. And they invited Vishy Anand as the chief guest. Vishy Anand turns up gives a speech and says, Indian Bank has done many inventions. Those days, you know, India had some international masters, about 10 of them, if I remember rightly. Most of the games between two international masters will end in agreed draws within 10 minutes. Sometimes they wouldn't even bother moving the pieces. They will just write the score sheet with moves and give it to you. And it was all taken very normally. They were they were different types altogether. So, Vishy Anand comes to 1989. Indian Bank Open and says in the function, I am very happy that Indian Bank Open is a round-robin tournament to make some of our lazy international masters play each other. So they made a knockout so that you are forced to play to proceed to the next round. I am very sure, you know, these kind of ideas, so many things Aaron has done in his lifetime. Uh, let's look at one more game of his. This was against the Portish. Uh, and it was again, this time it was from the next Olympiad at Varna in 1962. Portish was one of the best players from Hungary at that point. Great player, fantastic. By the way, Portish one book has been overlooked. Portish has written a very good book on endgames, you know that? No. For some reason, it uh, it never got the prominent that it, it, it deserves. I... I didn't have a pleasure. Once I borrowed this book from a friend in England and I had scanned through it for a week. Wonderful book, actually. I mean, for, for those days, once again. 600 Endings by Portish okay. was the name of the book, if I remember correctly. Nice. So, Portish here, playing with the white pieces against Manuel Aaron. It's Hungary versus India, 1962 okay. Olympiad. Will Sutin's curse hit here also? What's your opinion? What's your opinion? Come on, guess. But he's black, no? So he has to play G5 or something. 
Yeah, I, I don't do, think right? so. That's what you they are exactly. Let's see. Let's see what happens. D four, knight f six, c four, g six, knight f three, bishop g seven, g three, castles. So you have the king's Indian on the board. This was maybe king's Indian at that point. How would it be popular? Because I think Fisher had not yet come into prominence by now. It's still nineteen sixty two. Maybe he was like people were knowing about him now. uh because already by the age of 15 fisher had started uh, beating But there was bronze in him mm. for whom kings in and was a favorite you know those days you didn't have a system where all the games from all the tournaments used to get published so the world championship matches and the candidates matches and some us are championships and then if you are lucky enough to get pub- uh, magazines published on abroad like shakmatni bulletin from uh, from ussr British chess magazine, Chess Life and Review. So what you used to get in this magazine is only the top man, top quality, right? So if you had one bronze team who used to play the Kings Indian, that it was reasonably popular. Right. But okay, sixties and seventies basically Queen's Gambit declined was probably you know the center stage of uh, yeah. So castles, Knight B D seven, all very standard. Knight C three, E five, E four. So all played until now. H three. And he goes h6, solid. Yes. Okay, bishop e3, king h7, queen c2, queen e7, rook a d1. And if, now, like in present day, you are always playing with e d4, like you play uh, and try to play in the center, perhaps, or maybe with a5, you try to like take knight c5, maybe put the queen here, like a4. But at that point, of course, you have to go for the attack. In knight h5, rook f e1, <clears throat> rook g8. Okay, this is interesting. Suit in skirts is coming. <laughs> King h2, knight f8, c5. All according to the book. And yeah, I think white is slightly white, better. White is doing pretty well here. <laughs> Take to yeah. con e5, knight d7. <clears throat> Aaron, Aaron very strongly believed in material from the beginning. He mm-hmm. would he would never very rarely he would sacrifice material and he would never almost never ignore material given to him. Here he took took and now he's a pawn up, but his opponent clearly understood that you know he has this very nice center and the bishops. Ooh, yes, wow. This is basically you know the last three moves. The game has turned. Mm. Before that, both players were playing in the center. Okay, white, no doubt, white was slightly better always. I was just this thinking. I game. don't, I don't have an engine, but maybe here this could have been a better idea. No, if I just blocking the bishop. But I think Portis did. Bishop, bishop f three. Yeah. yeah. E five is really good. Queen f two is good. Yeah. Portis didn't think about this sacrifice that was coming up. Yeah. He... This was again. You know, you cannot. Call Aaron a dynamic player or an imaginative player. He was more of a logical player. Mm. But I am not surprised he found knight g three his player because every logic here points out to knight g three. The king said there is a king said sacrifice because you know the the g file is going to open. Yeah. Now he what now the... <laughs> comes now comes the move g five g five. This should also tell you right he was a dynamic player in a certain sense. Mm. He was not, you know. I mean, players of those era in India, they were most of them were what Ermolinsky will would say as spitter polishers. Make it slow, make things happen. But Aaron had the dynamism also in him. Mm. So he played here, and now G takes F four. And I'm I'm just wondering, can you not take this pawn, or is there something happening because Queen G five? Queen H just Queen H four just wins here. Uh, oh, H three is just con- yeah. yeah it also H three yeah. correct. Queen H four is over. So Bishop F two. Queen E six attacking H uh, three. If Bishop G two F three, I guess so. Uh, yeah. So that is uh, or just G2 just Rook G two. Rook G two. Rook G two. Queen H three. B E six is for the finish. Just like the game, how the game finished. So he went Bishop G four. Boom. Took, took. It's lost. King H one, check. King G one, 
And with Rukji, wow, what a game! I haven't seen this game actually before. Oh, I don't know. I don't know why I saw his win with white pieces against. Uh, maybe, maybe did he beat Portish again with white? I don't. I don't know. But uh, I have seen one where he maneuvers his knight very beautifully uh, uh -huh. against a strong player. So this one is. Something that I saw for the first time today. Wow, that's yes. Great... I think you are talking about is a game from Interzonal in 1960s. Yeah. It was against Portish or... only, right? Yeah, he defeated Portish with white pieces. Correct. I remember, but uh, I think it was from the Interzonal, not from right. Olympia. Right. I think. Right. Yeah. This Interzonal, he defeated many people who all went out because of him. They didn't qualify to the candidates or so. One of them was Portish. I remember this. He had told in an interview later on. Right. He defeated Portish and he defeated Averbach, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure about this. Yeah. But yes, he has defeated Portish. Twice. It was the same interzonal where he also met Fisher. Yes, yes, yes. yes and yes, with yes. Fisher, he, he played a game where he was doing quite okay till a point, yes. then he lost. And he said that Fisher uh, generally, you know, he despised the, the people from Soviet Union. So he would look for other people to sort of talk with talk and uh, Aaron was one of them and yes. I think he spoke about uh, some kind of cloth which was found in India, uh, some tailors in India oh. and all those things with, with Aaron and uh, I didn't know this, okay. Yeah, so I, I'm not surprised of course, okay. So in a way I think Fisher also, uh, I mean he knew Fisher and he knew the best in the world. So maybe in, in all senses he was the first a sort of representative of our country playing at the highest level. Like when I learned my chess in Coimbatore, uh, when I was growing up, this is how they used to introduce uh, Mr. Manoli. Here is a man who has actually spoken with Bobby Fisher in flesh and blue. So here is one picture of Aaron. Oh yeah, again. Try it. Yeah. Very Clean nice. Shaven. Very nice picture and this is one more. Yes. Can you spot the guy who is standing next to uh, Aaron's opponent? Can you can you recognize the guy? No. Rafiq Khan. Ah, Rafiq Khan. Yeah. So Aaron is playing against a veteran player named Abid Ali. Mm. And uh, next to Abid Ali is Rafiq Khan. Wow. You know, uh, Sarah, when I when I meet Aaron and I, you know, uh, whenever I get a chance, I think of him as someone who has so many stories, so many things about chess that he knows that happened, uh, like an encyclopedia. And I think one more thing which he has, yeah, is this book of Indian chess history. Yes. I From uh, 570 AD to 2010 uh, 570 AD to 2010 AD and it's written by Aaron and uh, Vijay Pandit and if you go through this book it talks about all the champions all the national champions of India and when I was young I think you remember uh, when we were in Pune they had come uh, there with this book and had put up a stall and so on and I 2014 thought 2014 World Junior Championship yes. yeah. and I thought to myself what would it like who would be interested in Indian chess history? What's the point? You know, I was not developed at that point. My yeah, thinking yeah. had not developed. And now when I look at this book, I'm like, wow, I want to know about someone. Like right now you spoke about, uh, you know, Abid Ali. I will go and read. I mean, this is the only way I can get to know about these people. Almost, almost. See, yeah. Aaron was also a columnist in uh, the Hindu newspaper, for which he used to write a weekly column. He used to write about all these things. Uh, we all used to wait for the Hindu on Sundays, you know, Arab's column after that, I think. Uh, Hariharan Andan used to write a column in Indian Express. You know, many things, many snippets from those periods. I wish someone had collected them and, you know, documented them because we all lost a huge uh, bunch of chess history, which was written in these columns. Yeah. I'm very sure there is still Aaron as a and have many, many stories to tell about the past Indian chess history, which is of big value, mm. not just interest, not just fun, big value to Indian chess. In my opinion. Mm. 
right yeah yeah whenever i send him some questions he sends me back with some very deep like big long answers very nice answers so i that's why i really um hope that you know i can speak more to him and uh, you know know more about indian chess history from, from... i told you about chessmate magazine so yeah. i became a subscriber in 1985 and i was very disappointed that in some issues there were not annotated games of some games because annotations of some games because i could not understand them i had just started playing chess at the age of 14 13 14 so i took a postcard and i wrote chess mate editor manuel eren dear mr eren it will be good if you publish more annotations in your magazine because we will we do not i do not understand these games without your commentary i got a reply within 10 days wow. in the same postcard type written so he he himself he was man of many talents including lot of soft skills he used to type quite fast on the typewriter type written dear young man i don't know how he addressed dear sir or whatever we note your interest about annotated games in chessmate and in the coming issues we will try our best to accommodate your request i mean you don't this is not customer service you didn't have american business <laughs> gurus to tell you how to increase your clientele this is simply the courtesy of a magazine editor just replying to a young boy who wanted annotations in his magazine because they know probably that it comes out of an interest from chess interest about chess yeah so completely different era completely different people but even things. when i met him like two months ago i asked him like what are you doing on the computer he's like i'm annotating a game for uh, chessmate yeah, he's still doing today, it yeah yes yes even, even today's now. chessmate is full of his annotations Correct. even today he annotates a lot yes, yes and he says now it's become easier to annotate because of the engines you know? <laughs> so again with changing times he has also uh, changed his perspective and and ha- is using engines and annotating them actually you know in 80s first they used to block set the magazine like he would just type out the magazine and send it to the publisher the publisher will publish by printing blocks but there was a period when the entire issue he will type it out in his uh, electronic typewriter which will be taken as a negative and printed straight away so the entire 64 pages minus the advertisements minus the photographs personally he would sit and type i have seen it with my own eyes yeah and all of this done uh, i mean at that point if you think about it no for no likes no uh, shares no subscribes <laughs> you know just just for the sake of what you love and i think it was very nice yeah that uh, because of such people chess in india has kept on growing it's uh, it's very inspiring you know like after this talk i feel like i should go and write one article uh, and and write it very deeply annotate it carefully and so on why oh, i am not surprised <laughs>